The water's fine, homie, jump into the deep end. So it you will reap it. We talking how to start it, how to grow it, how to keep it. Take a deep breath. You are now rocking with founders. All right, so now, now let's jump in. Let's jump in the sales side. A lot of you, your last business, you, you ran a software company, ran it for several years, many years. You were a co-founder in the business. You were responsible for the sales to start. And then so you sold a lot of the early accounts and, and the deals and the partnerships. And then you eventually had to grow a sales team. That sales team was there when you sold the business in 2018, 2018, 17, 2020, 2020. And then, and, and so I'd like to, you know, have a discussion around how do you, so as background in my last business, I was a primary salesperson. It was an agency, very relationship oriented. I was selling very high dollar amount things, hundred to four hundred thousand dollar a year relationships. And then I sold that business in twenty eighteen. And then here at Signal Insights, you know, we're selling lower dollar amounts, annual agreements, and and I have a sales team here, right? So hired salespeople built that up. And so I'd like to have a kind of discussion around how, what have you learned? What, what, what have we each learned around kind yeah. of building these things? This is a huge topic. I think we can like scratch the surface day and let's see how, well, let's jump in. So like how, you know, from, from your perspective, like what was it like moving from a founder led sales team where you get to make all the decisions, you know what to say, you know, maybe you don't have a script in your head cause you're an on, off the cuff kind of person. How, what, what was that like moving from you were running everything? to kind of hiring those first few people and building a sales team in that way? You know, I was actually the CTO when we started and my co-founder was supposed to be the one running sales because he knew the industry we were in, which is healthcare. I didn't know anything about it, New Python. And, and it's funny how it kind of, our roles flipped as, as he got way better at Python and, and I got worse. And I really started gravitating towards sales, not so much because it was like a huge passion, but because in order for us to survive, somebody had to like, pay the rent. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't very good at it. I remember we got into this accelerator and uh, we just randomly met a person. It's like, Hey, we run an accelerator in New York. You should apply. And then one time we were both coding till like three in the morning and, and like, Hey, the, remember that accelerator people we met, we met, they, their deadline is tonight. Like, do you want to apply? I mean, who knows? Like, who knows? Like, they give us 25K, which uh, would be uh, more than what we have now, which is a negative 200K. So we're like, okay, well, what is it? Okay, it's just a video. They just had like a video application. All right, perfect. So we just turned a video and he was just like coding. And, and it's funny because they played that years later, but just, it was just like us at four in the morning. Like, hey, so, 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 so. And like, that was it. And uh, did you have any customers at that point? No, we had zero customers. And no product. We had like an iPad, yeah, the prototype. And they flew to Charlotte and we met, we ended up getting to Accelerator, moved to New York. And I remember in the Accelerator, nobody knew anything about our space, right? And so in Accelerator, they bring you people from like large companies, but we were selling to small, to your point, small businesses. And so pharmacies to pharmacies. And one of the Accelerator guys would be like, Hey, let's get on sales together. I was like, Oh no. And finally we got on some sales together and, um, mm -hmm. And it really helped a lot to have another person that was like pushing me like, okay, you have to make X amount of sales, X amount of calls every day to these pharmacies. Cause it was just really, really disheartening to like call somebody. They wouldn't want to talk to you. And so it was, it was really hard. So what worked for us was not that, was, I mean, that taught me perseverance in general, but, but what, what worked better is going to conferences. So we started going <laughs> to pharmacy conferences, went to one. And we, we, when we have a whole game plan now, we get into like how to like optimize a conference. Cause like, there's like a whole thing from like, we substitute their name badges with our name badges. Like we don't wear anybody's brand. It's gotta be our brand. We do, we change everything about how, how conference sales are done. But at these conferences, we we're able to get a few customers. And, and so we're like, okay, now let's go to every conference. Like there's a lot of conferences. And I remember one of the guys at the conference in Georgia called me up like, Hey, I saw you guys are trying to register. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're trying to register for the Georgia. I apply for every state pharmacy conference. And, and the guy in Georgia, I was like, hey, I really love what you're doing. I'm like, oh, okay, great, great, great. So can you give me a discount? Because I was always negotiating discounts on the conference. Like, the conference like $1,200. And I was like, hey, can you get it for $500? And then he was like, oh, no, it's got to be $1,200. Okay, how about $800? So an event, I was always like, oh, we don't need carpet. Or we don't need like a table. We don't, <laughs> just 
<laughs> show up. Who just show up? And this guy was like, no, I don't want to talk to you about that. I want to talk about the product. I love what you're doing. I think I think more people should should get it. Like, is there any way like I can I can sell for you? And like, oh, okay. Well, we don't have like <laughs> program. I guess we were just like we were just raising our first seed round, and, and it was just barely had a few nickels to scrape together. And I told the guy, look, we actually have two conferences this weekend coming up, and I can only be in one. And and so how about this? I know I never met you, but there's a conference in Oregon, so I'm gonna buy a plane ticket, a hotel. And I'm going to ship all the conference material to the hotel and you go there. And if you can get enough sales to cover your flight, the hotel, <laughs> all the cost of this, then you're hired. And this guy was like, okay. <laughs> you never met this guy. Never met just over the phone. So what happened? So he flew, he, he, so he actually didn't get any sales at the conference, I don't think. But the fact that you, you went, it was a tough conference. It's a rough group out there. And. And I don't think he got any sales, but the fact that he did that and went the extra mile was like, okay, let's, let's keep rolling. And, and he started becoming, going to conferences we together and he got really good. You hired him. Yeah. Yeah. Initially, I think it was, it was, was it commission. I forget. No, we didn't do commission. That's a big thing. Actually. I don't believe in commission. So had to be him just a salary, but started off as a low salary and, and he just became the most successful salesperson that we've ever had he just he's just relentless he was like a iron man he had done like three or four iron man he's not one of those it takes one of those people like you see these army people again to see i was like it takes that sort of mentality that like i'm not the best salesperson and i don't think i should be like i should be able to know how to do it but i think my job is to optimize the process so that people like this guy and and then the people we end up hiring more of so they can be successful i should not be if i'm the best salesperson and then there's like a major, major things wrong with the situation. Why? Cause you don't see yourself as a salesperson. No, because I think like my value to the business should be other. Now I should distinguish something very important, which is, I think there's a big difference between small and large deals. So and I say small is probably under 5,000 a year. That's when that's the model we've done. And that's where I think it, it requires scaling. And if I'm the best person selling, just like calling people day long, and that's like the best value I can add to the company, then, then we're in trouble. Right. That's what I mean. Like either I'm not hiring good enough people to be better cold calling like than me, or I'm just not using my skills appropriately. So for the larger deals, I do think a founder sort of involvement. I mean, even the, I think the CEO of box.com is still shows up at sales mm -hmm. meetings when they sell some huge, you know, document thing to the NASDAQ or whatever, right? Cause it's used on multi-million or ten, tens of millions of deal. Then yeah, sure. CEO should definitely be around for, for that kind of stuff. But for small I deals, I think I it should be down to like a engineered like recipe that you hmm. can just like rinse and repeat. So what did you find worked when, when, when looking for good salespeople and you did not pay them commission? So these people only got paid salaries. Yeah. And look, we've made a lot of mistakes on the way. I think from last episode, Jeremy talking about culture, I think that's something we could have done better in that, like, for example, I said, you could be doing, this was before COVID. So I said, you could be remote. You could be anywhere you want to be in the world. You could do anything you want to do. As long as you make the sales quota, I literally do not care if you're on a beach or anywhere. And we had people that, that would really push that. Like we had <laughs> folks that would make Moscow mules at like 11 AM in the office and then they call. We had people that disappeared and then would make calls and like, Hey, where are you? Like, oh, I was in Las Vegas gambling while also making sales calls <laughs> for closing deals. So it's like, well, I really got to live up to what I promised you. It really became a little bit of a crazy town. And I think in hindsight, that went a little that was your culture. Far, a little too far. <laughs> I, I, I failed to define our culture well enough. <laughs> But what we did do is, you know, we started out, we hired in threes, we hired three people at a time and, and everybody had to make the amount of their monthly salary in sales by the end of the first month, or they wouldn't continue. And usually one or two out of three would, would end up making it. So then it all, it all grew and yeah, eventually, so that took us to 20 plus people in, in who, sales. Who trained all those people? Well, I did eventually, initially, and then I hired folks to manage it. I'd say it's another mistake made. It's like. I don't think sales like you promote and you've learned this. I'm sure you've read this. 
they just never like promote your salespeople into being managers right. just because they're best salespeople doesn't mean they'll be the best managers. Yeah. I think I even knew that at the time, but I still, still, still well, somebody's got to manage them. Right. So <laughs> I think, I think those sayings leave, leave the question open to like, well, how, who do you, well, who hire? do you hire? You hire some like rando off the streets. It's just like, Hey, I'm going to manage you from now on. I've done that more recently. And that, that has, that doesn't work. Cause again, that person's different, different culture. Hiring from within is much better, but like who do you hire like a bad salesperson? Okay. I've done that too. Cause then, then the good salespeople are going to be like, well, I'm going to take orders from this guy. I like sell 10 times more than him. Like fuck this guy. Right. So I think it's, it's a challenge that people know like you shouldn't do things, but nobody tells but you who no should do. Like, no, that's why I think sales ops actually is, is probably like the biggest challenge organizations have not actual sales. It's the ops of the sales. Sales are, sales people are so disorganized and like, they don't like, they don't know what they're doing moment to moment. So like the most important act is like, how do you organize them, you know, in an operational way and motivate them and, and keep them and incentivize them. Yeah. I, I, I agree. All right. Let's, uh, th that was great. How, wh wh what do you think separated, you know, the top salesperson that you had top, maybe one, two, three or four of them from an average one or not, not as good one. I don't know that we've ever figured that out. I think at the end of the day, it's like mental toughness. I think the ability to have a short memory, to not take things personally, to move on, to be relentless. And so folks that tend to be a little more, you know, emotional, get offended, you know, and honestly, I put myself in that category. Or if somebody tells me no on a call, like I spent 30 minutes thinking about it. Whereas the people that were successful, they like didn't think about it at all. They just keep calling one lead like over and over again, no matter how mean or how like, they would joke with them. Like when they were me, they just have the ability to just, you know, get through any barrier. And I think some of that can be taught that, but I'd say you know, 90 plus percent plus is just the mental toughness they were raised with. Like, I mean, it's like our top salesperson, her father, I think was like a policeman. Or, so I find like a pattern of like kind of growing up in sort of some, some sort of mental tough situation hmm. where you had to persevere puts you in a good position to be a successful salesperson for these types of sales. Yeah. Cause it's a, and, and when you say these types of sales, I, I think it's important because when people say salespeople, you, you know, there's so many different types of sales, right? You, you know, you could be selling used cars, you could sell brand new cars, you could sell $500,000 cars, even in that industry, there, there's yeah. a lot of different things. You could sell financing for cars. And then, you know, in software, like in what we, well, what I do and what you used to do, that there's so many types of software, right? If you if yeah. you're an account exec selling ten million dollar year box dot com contracts, that type of sale is very different than selling, you know, Dropbox to a small business, right? For for five thousand dollars a year, maybe. But you could even sell like similar products or similar but 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 the type of sales is different. You know, my my brother is one of the top salespeople at Johnson Controls, Fortune fifty company sells a lot of money and, and a lot of his deals, these are huge deals and, and a lot of government deals. So it's very trust-based, a lot of relationships. He's, you know, he has to build trust with these people sometimes for years before they do business with them. And that takes just a lot of discipline and patience. And, and maybe you're not getting told no a hundred times a day, right. like, like you're saying, but maybe you're getting told no in these micro ways because they're ignoring it. Yeah, I agree. I think there's like, you're right. They are different. And we mentioned some of the differences between small and, and big accounts. I think yeah, with small accounts, it's much easier to track number success. Like we we're just talking about, like I built the, my sales team with big accounts. It's harder to track if someone's successful, right? If, if they have some of these conversations like your brother has, how do you know six months in that mm -hmm. they're any closer to a deal than they were before? They haven't closed anything. And I think the challenge there becomes like estimating based on, you know, people's conversations or, or, you know, they opened up more conversations. They had more LOIs or potential. I'm actually doing this right now with, with Troy eyes is, is selling bigger accounts, which is different, but there are also similarities. And I think like the most important part is kind of the, the, the process by which somebody sells anything I think is the same, like what, and this is, I think we talked about outside before, which is the, the Sandler, David mm -hmm. Sandler, I think his book and method and highly recommend people read it. But what I got out of it and how we built our sales process was really around these, these pain, pains, the pain points customers have, and really identifying a few that are really, really like 
deep pain points. So like we can't even, yeah, we can even role play this right now. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're, you're having trouble with, what are you having trouble with? Churn. All right. So I would say this is the, the most important part of the sales process is identifying the pain and then really, really like helping the person feel it. So they, so I'd say, okay, Taylor, so how many customers have you, have you turned you know, in, the, in the last year? Right. This is not true, but, but 400. All right. All right. So those 400, how much revenue would that have been if you had kept them? I don't know. And, and I'll keep going. All right. Let's say you know, a million dollars, right? right? A million dollars. Okay. So then, okay. So, you, so you're saying, and this is really important, like the repetition of it to like, you're saying that, that if, if there was a magical way right, to, to have kept those, well, let's say, you know, let's say you even kept 20% of them, right? That would, that would have been $200 worth of revenue for you this year. Is that 20, right? 200,000. Yeah. Right. So now you would want to identify a few of these, not just one, right? So you'd, you'd pick what other pain points around that might be, you know, like maybe there's a reason that this is common like is it because the market conditions right the market conditions affect you mm -hmm. okay well how do they affect you besides time? hiring people people so like it's hard to get talent is that talent more expensive now right yeah mm -hmm. and let's say if you if you were to spend you know forty thousand dollars a year last year now you're having to spend fifty thousand dollars mm -hmm. more so that's ten thousand more dollars that you have to spend to get to get the same or do you do you get the same or or yeah yeah. Okay. So that's ten thousand dollars more, but you're also at the same time losing two hundred thousand. Okay. So the most of the conversation needs to be spent identifying these pains mm -hmm. and honestly getting you to talk. I know I'm talking a lot right now, but in a successful conversation, it's really important that the salesperson doesn't do more than thirty percent of the talking. It's mm -hmm. really hard, but you got to ask really good questions that gets the other person talking about the problems. And it might seem like a waste of time, but it's actually really, really valuable to, to, to make them really feel those pains. And I think there's a real challenge. You know, I, I've read Sandler. I'm, I'm a big fan of a lot of the methodology. I, I think that some of these tactics are hard nowadays because, because people have put up these barriers to them, you, you know? So for instance, when somebody starts down this path that you're talking about, I don't give answers. So I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Just show me your product. Just show me. Mm -hmm. And, and. Now, maybe a lot of people aren't like that. There's, you know, it's interesting. We, we both have read the same book. And what I took away from Sandler, that there were two big things I took away from Sandler. One was the, the rep, so that there's, there's rapport building at the beginning of the call or at the beginning of a meeting, right? And what Sandler talks about is it might be one minute long, it might be two minutes. It's not 30. And, and so I spend two to four minutes trying yeah. to figure out like, how, how do I make a connection? Not too long because you don't want to feel like wasting your time. And then the other one, that I really, really like, and I use a lot is pre-commitments. So in other words, like, you know, we have a meeting of the minds. I'm not going to send you a contract. I'm not going to send you a proposal. I'm going to say, so Flavia, do you think like, just like, cause, cause I think a common tactic when somebody does not want to buy, they say, just send me the contract, just send me the, send me the details. No, let's talk about them. Like, do, you know, do, do you want to buy this for $5,000? I don't know. I need to think about it. What do you need to think about it? Like, oh, well, do, do you want it or not? Like, if you don't, it's okay. And, and part of what I took away from Sandler is that giving them this, if they're going to say no, just say no, like yeah. just permission to just, if this yeah. isn't a fit, just tell me. Yeah. Um, because if they're not going to buy, they're not going to buy. It's really simple as that. There's no convincing them to buy. And I want to know if they're a no, but if they're a maybe, like if they're a, mm -hmm. sure, I could buy or what have you, then it's like, okay, under what conditions would you buy? And you know, in this business, I'm selling something that's not you know, it's not hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And so I can't spend six calls right. trying to figure out this is going to work. Right. Um, and, and did you ask him, what would it take? I do. I, I say, and I find that this is a very difficult thing to train someone to do mm. because I only do it because I've done this thousands of times and I just got to pick this up over time. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a very, it's an uncomfortable conversation yeah. to, to ask you. Right. So Flavio, do you like, what would it take to make this work? It's an uncomfortable thing for me to ask you. And also I have to just wait for right. you because you might be actually uncomfortable in saying right. an answer. And so I have to kind of force it in a way. And I don't apply too much pressure because I don't want to make it weird. Right. <laughs> but I do want to understand, like, is there a scenario where you will buy? 
this happened twice today, as a matter of fact. So, so there, so there was a guy, we did a, we do trials with our client, with prospects. He did a two week trial and then he's like, ah, sorry, man, this isn't going to work. That was six months ago. He emails me a month ago and he goes, Hey, I'd like to revisit it. And I say, okay, when people come back, there's a very high percentage chance that they're going to buy. Right. So then the trial ended two days ago. We did the trial and, and, and then he's gone silent on me. And so then I hit them up on LinkedIn. I text them. I do everything. And he messages me today because I, I said, Jake, is it just not a fit right now? And that's what I say. And he goes, you're right. I just can't get this done. Come back to me in June. And that's okay. Like I'll yeah. come back to him in June. I'll probably buy. So, but if I just hammer him, hammer him, hammer him and ignore me or say, fuck off. Yeah. I think it's so much like nuance in this that makes it hard. No, I think that's really great. The out is really important. Yeah, I do think that, like, I don't believe in trials. I really think that, yeah, the trials, honestly, I think ruin the potential sale. You sold your product for a year. You, you sold a year-long subscription and they never tried it. No trial. We never did a trial. Did they do a demo? We did the demos at first, but then as we got better at the Sandler method, you know, we we did like a best salesperson, they hardly did demos because they got wow. so good at at the process of identifying pains that as long as they at the end you tie it back to like this solves your pain, which is like just a few minutes at the end, then that's all. Like what I learned through that process was that sales really has nothing to do with with uh, the product we're selling. It's got everything to do with the problem that they're having. And as soon as we fully get that, they fully get that we understand the pain. And so they trust, okay, he gets my pain. I got it. All right. And this, this pill solves the pain. You'll take the pill, even though you don't know what you just took, right? It could have been, could have killed you, right? It could have been a pill that kills you, could have been a pill that cures you, but you don't know, right? You, when you, when you take a pill, mm -hmm. you're kind of thinking like, okay, this is going to, this is going to cure me. I believe it. Somebody, somebody addressed this pain in a way that I feel I'm going to take the chance. Mm -hmm. And of course you got to deliver, otherwise they won't renew, right? They'll turn, they'll be upset. So of course you do have to deliver on product eventually, but I just think the sales process has nothing to do with the product. Wow. All you can do is ruin the sale because then they'll get into the trial and be like, well, what about, what about this? I thought it did whatever mental picture they had of what their ideal thing was. Now it's at, at, at odds with the reality. Whereas once they buy, their psychology functions exactly the opposite way because now it's like, Oh, I've already committed money. So if, if, if this doesn't fit my mental reality, then I look like an idiot. So your, your brain is gonna, it's gonna try to make things actually, no, this is what I wanted because I wouldn't have been so dumb to pay $10,000 on something I don't want. So this, this they're starting to like force it into using it. They'll, they'll, you know, ask their customer, Hey, why aren't you using this? We like pay money. They'll become like real champions. Cause they, again, they want to make sure it was a good decision and justify their own. Yeah. Decision. Decision. Right. Love it. All right. Let, let's, let's hop into maybe one or two more. What do we got? Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. When you sold the business, what, roughly what percentage of the revenue were you directly responsible for? Or like, were you mm -hmm. still selling or, or versus your, your team? So like what percentage were you still responsible? It's a good point. Cause I did, I was still using, I, I was still doing the bigger customer sales like the larger chain of pharmacies that was on me. And I tried to hire people for that. And that was tougher because of what you're saying with the, with the relationship. There's one guy that got pretty good at it, but I still felt having the, having me around for some of the large deals was, was important. So about call it 20% was still attributed so to me. I get, and did salespeople like ever bring you or your co-founder into deals were, were you ever used as a carrot? Like, Hey, I can bring one of our co-founders into this or, or really did they operate in silos and they, they kind of did it, sold it, moved on. Well, we did webinars and occasionally they would try to do that, but it honestly didn't matter. It, it really, it didn't, it didn't, these people didn't care who founded it, right? Like mm -hmm. when you buy Salesforce or stuff, you don't expect the founder to show up. And if he does, I'm not going to be like, wow, I'm going to buy Salesforce now because uh, what's his name showed up <laughs> Mark Penny like, I don't, <laughs> you know I mean? or even for a tiny software. Like, I don't think, I don't see how that would influence my behavior. But some salespeople thought it was cool and they would do it. But I was like, no, stop doing that. Like, that's not, it's not what it's about. 
again it's about their pains not about us nobody like nobody's like we don't have like super fans out there of our <laughs> software but oh my god i follow you on linkedin you're so great like, it's not what it's not it's not the reason <laughs> they're not a fan club right we're, we're just all product all right last question did, did your did you find that your conversion rate fluctuated over time and if so what what kind of impacted that that, that conversion rate change over time mm -hmm. Well, I was really bad at first. But I think, I think, I improved over time as our processes got better. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I think, I think, but I wouldn't do much of the sales, right? Again, I really didn't see my job as selling. So, like, we're always just be adamant about automating, reviewing calls. We do a lot of call reviews with each other, and uh, what I really love to do is role play, where, where you would play customer potential customer and I'll play the salesperson and then we'd swap, right? Then I'll be, hmm. and then it would be like this little game of like, okay, throw any like objection you can my way. Right. And then the, the other person's job would be to overcome it. And so I think, I think those were really, really helpful. There's specific word. Once you identify these pains in your industry, like in ours was DIR fees, which are these fees pharmacies get, and there's a specific language of how you talk hmm. about them that really resonates with people and how they talk about them. And so when we, Get on a call and listen some of the sales people just like have slightly off sayings right because they couldn't remember or whatever the script or it's like it's so important that they use the exact right word and so you have to use the lingo you have to use like the exact like word that they they understand they resonate so i think all that role playing really really helped what about the call reviews what, what, what do you mean did, did you have a process for this like what, what did that look like yeah, so we we would do random call reviews as a group. So we would literally like pull up from last week, we have a sales meeting, and we'd like, let's pull up three random calls and review them as a group. And this like really kept everybody like. <laughs> oh, so you, you pull them up and everybody yeah, watch them. Yeah, and like watch that. them and, and comment and give feedback and thoughts. And and so I think it like, that's what we did mostly. Then managers review them one-on-one, -on -one, but nobody ever wants to do that. And And so I found it more effective when done as a group then when done Did people give feedback like would, would just watch them and move on or, or people yeah, give feedback on? Like, yeah give feedback as a group right so then we all learn again this might like shame people because then a person will be like oh are you picking on me or not? but okay, hey this is random like we just pick a random call so it could be anybody it could be one of mine actually right so i think i think trying to like even it out a little bit helps but at the end of the day sales is always going to be that way like i I don't know that you can have like a culture of like, you know, rainbows, rainbows and flowers and happiness, but also high performing sales. Yeah. Like it's just, there's tension, there's competitive nature between salespeople. We had like a leaderboard of who's doing well. And it was always like, you know, she neat. And I'll be like, oh, well, she's stealing my leads. And like, well, she's, all, she's always like, there's double attribution in Salesforce and she always gets them first. But, uh, like there's always going to be like <laughs> stuff like Excuses. that. Feelings. I, I love it. I love it. What else? This is great. Yeah. One, one, one last question is who would you recommend to be someone's first hire? So if someone's doing sales right now, maybe they're doing it themselves and they can only hire one person. Like what, 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 what would you say? What would you recommend that, that, that first hire be? Hmm. Well, so I really think the person should sell themselves first. Like I sold the first, even though I was very good at it, I still think it's important that founder sells yes. and stuff. And totally. It creates a process for other people to sell. I see this over and over again of like people trying to hire salespeople in the hope that they'll sell or they'll create the process or they'll, and it no, never works. It never works. It and never people works. are super expensive and ends works. up like wasting everybody's time and money. And, uh, and, you, and you, and you lose momentum. Like they, they lose, cause they lose faith. The founder can lose faith in the sales themselves. Cause, cause they're like, oh shit, I brought in this pro and they can't exactly. even sell it. So I'd recommend exact opposite. Like what we've done is we, we hired people like straight out of school, right? They were literally like their first job and they know nothing about, you know, sales or this industry or the process. And, but they have a lot of energy and they're like really excited to, to do stuff. And I think that puts you in a good position because A, they're not gonna be super expensive and B, it forces you to actually train them because otherwise they literally can't do it. So <laughs> you're, you have to, you're forced to create a process that somebody just after school can do and if they fail you fail right because they're just you know they're just there to do whatever you want right, right. so if, if, if they can follow your your process your system yeah. like, surely don't don't be fooled into thinking that some guy with 20 years of experience at ibm can can do it 
So I'll recommend that. I love it. That's great. Any other parting questions, wisdom, thoughts? This is great. I'm glad you brought it up, man. I think there's a lot more to go into, like, if people ever want to deep dive into more into this, I think the like conferences or, or webinars, I think webinars are like a huge, huge on tap resource. We, we leveraged it a ton. All so. right. We're going to talk about webinars next time. That's great. <laughs> All, All right. right. I think that's a wrap. All right, man. Have a good one. Thank you for rocking with the homies. Taylor, trusty and flazzy. Seize the day on it. Until next time. Hold it down. Hold it down. Hey.